All right, good morning, everybody. This is Susan Shanna, Emory University. Um, this morning, for this morning's briefing, we have Dr. Nadine Caslow, that's N-A-D-I-N-E, K-A-S-L-O-W. She is the professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Emory University School of Medicine. And this morning, she's gonna be discussing anxiety and fear, depression, grief, and other mental health issues related to COVID-19. And in fact, during this time, Dr. Kessler has been working leading a team that's providing mental health support, guidance, and counseling to some of our, many of our frontline health workers, healthcare workers, and the public. So she's gonna be addressing the, uh, um, how people can use effective coping strategies and be resilient during this time, both for uh, patients and people who are um, dealing with uh, family members that may be patients and who are in their homes. So I'll give you, I'll remind you all that we need everyone to keep uh, their um, sound on mute, be it, remain on mute. And we will, uh, following Dr. Kaslow's uh, presentation, we will take questions via the chat function. Um, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Kaslow. Thank you. Good morning. And I'm really pleased to be here today to talk about what I think we're increasingly feeling like is a pandemic within a pandemic. And that's our mental health crisis right now in our country and worldwide. When I think about why we're having so many mental health challenges, I think there are lots of reasons. One is that isolation is incredibly difficult and challenging for people. It's really, really hard. And we have a lot of evidence that being in quarantine is emotionally very stressful. On the other hand, we have people who are still needing to go to work in a variety of workplaces. And that's frightening and scary for them too. Our lives are incredibly disruptive, and that's difficult for all of us. And finally, we're encountering countless losses, loss of health and wellness, of loved ones, financial losses, loss of normalcy and routine. All of these can add to our mental health challenges. What we're seeing is an increase in crisis calls, text to crisis hotlines, um, suicide-related calls to 911 and the like. And so we're really feeling the emotional impact of this. People, whether they're children or adults or older adults, are experiencing many, many different symptoms. And at different times in the course of this pandemic, some symptoms may be more dominant than others. Initially, and, and still now, there's been a tremendous amount of anxiety and fear and panic. Many people are talking about having problems eating, but even more problems sleeping. Lots of difficulties falling asleep and staying asleep. Many people are feeling lonely. That's different than being isolated. Isolated is when you can't be with other people. Lonely is when you feel like there are, aren't other people to connect with. People are having lots of somatic complaints. Every time somebody coughs, they're wondering, do I have COVID-19? So lots of focus on physical symptoms. People are feeling frustrated and irritable. Lots of people are talking about being short with one another, with their family, with their coworkers. And, and there's certainly anger, anger at many different situations. Many people are feeling helpless. They're feeling powerless. And that, those are very uncomfortable feelings. And I think one of the messages we are trying to give to people is that it's so important to take control of what we can control during this pandemic and sort of come to a place of acceptance for the things that we cannot control. And that can help us feel less helpless and powerless. There's a tremendous amount of guilt. People feel guilty that their children aren't learning as much as they should be learning. They feel guilty if they go to work. They feel guilty if they don't go to work and the like. Not but surprisingly, many people are turning to substance abuse or misuse, alcohol, uh, illicit drugs to try to help calm them down. But those are sort of short term and they end up having more negative than positive effects. We're experiencing a collective trauma or a series of collective traumas right now. And as a result, there's a lot of trauma related symptoms that people are experiencing symptoms related to post-traumatic stress disorder. And of course, the closer one is to the pandemic, either in terms of their workplace or the loss of people close to them or themselves being really sick, then the more likely they are to have trauma symptoms. 
many people are feeling sad, having a hard time enjoying things, not finding things pleasurable, and, and getting depressed. And we're seeing actually, as the anxiety starts to abate some, as people are getting more used to this, and we are in this sort of longer, more drawn out phase, waiting for potentially another surge, then what happens here, or potentially the surge, what happens is people are feeling more sad right now. There's also evidence that there's increased rates of suicidality, suicidal thoughts, suicidal actions, uh, and possibly even death by suicide. That's less clear and time will tell about that. But there are more people calling about that. There are even people talking about trying to get exposed to COVID-19 as a way to try to die by suicide. And there's been a lot of conversation about all the grief we're experiencing people going through the various stages of grief that we're all so familiar with. But I want to highlight a recent stage of grief that people have started to talk about. And that's a final stage called finding meaning. And I think for us all to do as well as we can through this pandemic and beyond is going to be through finding meaning in our lives. Our reactions, as I mentioned, are changing to this, our psychological reactions over time. And there are some groups of people who are struggling more than others with um, emotionally in response to COVID-19. Of course, people with a history of mental health problems are, may have more difficulties right now or an exacerbation of their symptoms. We're also seeing that communities who have less, that have less privilege um, are being more impacted by COVID-19, are more likely to be exposed or having worse outcomes. And so people in those communities are having more psychological symptoms as well. And certainly people more on the front lines, healthcare workers, people working in hospitals, sort of seeing COVID-19 and its devastating effects up close and personal are likely to have more mental health challenges. In addition to having mental health symptoms right now, people are talking about the, the pandemic having a tremendous effect on their relationships on their relationships with their children, uh, people being separated from their children potentially because one or more people have to be in isolation or quarantined or they're feeling like that's in people's best interest, worried about their children learning, getting into conflicts with their children about learning, um, things like that. Also, we're seeing some mounting reports of increased rates of child abuse, unfortunately, right now. So that's a major concern that we have related to children. There's also many people are talking about challenges with their partner, having lots of conflict or difficulties with their partners. And unfortunately, again, we're seeing increased reports of domestic violence or intimate partner violence. And unfortunately, because people are so closed in and quarantined, they're having a harder time when they're being abused, getting out of the situation and finding safety. People are often concerned about older parents, whether or not they can see them, feeling worried that they can't help take care of them, feeling concerned that we know that older adults are at increased risk for COVID-19 and for its negative effects. And so there's a lot of stress and worry about parents. And then people in general are having a harder time seeing family, seeing friends. We're all doing a lot virtually, but it's not the same. A virtual hug isn't the same as a real hug. And we're missing out on important life events for people. There's been a lot of conversation about things like graduation, weddings, funerals, and the like. And that many of these marker events that are so important to us, that have so many rituals, we're having to find either creative ways to do them, or unfortunately, we're not able to participate in them at all. And that's been incredibly stressful for people. Despite the stress and challenge and the symptoms and difficulties people are having, I firmly believe that most of us are quite resilient in the face of adversity. And that not only are we resilient and we can manage and cope effectively, but that we can grow from these experiences. When people talk about when are things going back to normal, my thought is I, they're never going to go back to that normal. Things are gonna go forward in different ways. And I help, hope that some of the good that comes out of this pandemic, we can take forward with us and grow from. 
and, and unfortunately, we, we know we're going to take some of the bad with us. But I really, truly hope that some of the things that people are doing, like spending more time gardening or hanging out with their family more, exercising more, some of those things, doing more relaxation, that we can continue to do some of those things. I think for us to be resilient and to grow in the face of this terribly adverse and awful situation, um, there are a number of things that we can do to cope and to cope well. One of the most important things is to stay connected. And fortunately, we do have the internet and we do have social media and we do have countless apps that allow us to stay more connected to family and friends. So many people are talking about connecting with people that they haven't heard from in years. And so prioritizing that is a major way for people to do better during this time. I also believe that we need to foster and even reinvent wellness. People are finding with the springtime coming that being outside, being in nature, just being outside and eating outside or planting flowers or listening to the birds really helps. Exercise, exercise, exercise. We know that's good for people's physical well being, it's good for their emotional well being. Eating well during these times. There's been tremendous conversation about listening to apps or YouTubes that help people relax, breathe deeply, be more mindful, stay present in the moment. This helps with our wellness and it also helps us manage our stress and manage our anxiety. Of course, if the stress, the anxiety, our symptoms get too bad, there's a lot of professional help out there right now. We've been able to do a remarkable job in this country transitioning to telehealth and making available in many ways more mental health services that are more accessible to more people. I mentioned earlier that one group of people who I've been spending a lot of time with who are really struggling are healthcare workers on the front lines. There's been a lot written about the added stress they're under, concerns about whether or not they have enough, not just protective equipment, personal protective equipment, but whether all of the policies and guidelines and procedures are keeping them protected enough. They're worried about infect getting infected themselves and infecting their loved ones. They're working long hours with patients who are very sick. It's very sad to watch people ill and dying, potentially with family members not there because of the limited visitation that's possible. And, and we're seeing increasing reports of healthcare workers getting sick and dying related to COVID-19. And so, so the stress on healthcare workers is absolutely enormous. There are a number of things that we're encouraging them to do to try to help themselves during this time. It's critically important that they take care of themselves, not just at home, like we're talking about everybody need to take, take care of themselves, but also in the workplace. We're encouraging them to do things like prayer circles or listening to a mindfulness app together as a team, maybe in the middle of a shift, to just try to help everybody sort of center themselves and, and feel more relaxed and calmer as they navigate through the next few hours of their shift. When a patient dies um, from COVID-19, it's so important for healthcare workers to take a moment of silence at the bedside, include family, even virtually in whatever way they can, and honor that person and their life. And I also think at the end of shifts, we're encouraging teams when they get into their huddle and transition to the next team to really talk about what they're grateful for. I think this is a time where despite all the losses and the challenges, we each need to focus on the things that we're grateful for. Doing that at the end of the day, I encourage people to do, and for healthcare teams at the end of the shift. It's also so important for them to promote teamwork and to really find ways to optimize how effectively they work together so they can get through this difficult time. I think for healthcare workers like everybody right now, showing compassion to their patients, to each other is so important. Many, many people right now are feeling better because of the small ways in which they're being compassionate towards other people, helping out neighbors, helping out an older adult who may need more assistance. So I think for healthcare workers and non-healthcare workers alike, really showing compassion towards others 
And one of the hardest things that people often have to do is show compassion toward themselves. Under this stress, we're making mistakes, we're learning new things that we didn't know, and so having to maybe apologize for what went wrong last week because we know something different this week, and really being kind to ourselves, um, not putting too many expectations on ourselves or judging ourselves too high. Again, that's true for everybody. Healthcare workers also have to really be thoughtful about the ethical decisions they're encountering right now and being sure that they're being guided by their ethical values and their general values. There are many existential questions and concerns that are coming up for healthcare workers and for everyone related to life, the meaning of life, and these need to be grappled with right now. And that's really difficult and not something we usually take the time to do. But I think that if we can address some of these existential issues, think about them, reflect on them, talk with one another about them, that will really help us during this challenging time. And finally, I think for everyone, it's so important to find meaning, to find purpose, to do things that matter to us, to find ways, small, medium, or large, to make a difference, to make a difference in our own lives, in the lives of others, and in the lives of our community. I think it's finding that purpose, that meaning, that will help us deal with the pain and the grief and the loss and be able to move forward in productive ways. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions now. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Caslow. Um, a reminder to enter your questions into the chat function. Uh, Dr. Caslow, can you see the questions there in front of you? Yes, okay. I can. All right, the first question um, was, do you believe a silver lining to this pandemic is a possible increase in mental health resources and more of a drop stigma to speaking about mental health wellness? That's really an excellent question, and I truly hope that that can be a silver lining. We have tremendous stigma in our country about mental health services, and I think as they become more available, easier to access, more people recognizing that they need them, that, and people actually talking a lot more about mental health than we, when, than we usually do. I'm really hoping that this can help us make even a greater dent in the stigma reduction that's so important in our community, in our country. Next question, for those of us who are looking out for family members or neighbors, what are some warning signs we should look out for? I think whenever you see a change in someone's behavior, that's the first thing I would look out for. So somebody who was always gregarious and now is more uh, withdrawn. Somebody who starts complaining about all sorts of worries and concerns and didn't used to do that. So I would really look for a change in, in behavior. If all somebody can talk about is COVID-19 and its impact on them, and they're having a hard time sort of talking about anything else, all they're doing is reading or watching the news, and, and that's sort of become their whole life, I would be concerned about that as well. And of course, people who are touched most personally, either they get sick or a loved one or somebody they really are close to or care about gets sick or dies, then those are people that I really think we need to be on the lookout as well. If somebody talks about not wanting to go on like this, not wanting to live, wanting to join a loved one who either died before or died recently, then those would be very serious warning signs. In terms of mental health, what are the three to five things people can do daily to cope with this pandemic, especially with the 24-7 coverage of this, which can be overwhelming? So I know you're all in the media, and I really value um, all that the media has done to help us through this difficult time, to inform us, to give us tips, to give us suggestions. But I am strongly recommending that people find ways that work for them to limit the amount of media coverage, whether they watch or listen or do whatever ways they get their, their news a certain number of times a day. Some people are doing that. Some people have the apps that are controlling how many hours a day they're paying attention to the news. Um, but and it's not just limiting our news consumption, but as I mentioned before, also limiting the time we're spending talking about this. 
I think every day it really helps people to have a schedule, or if not a schedule, then little things that they want to accomplish that day and to do things to little things each day on their list. And finally, I think we all need to do things to take care of ourselves. People have been saying this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. It's not like any marathon I've ever seen. Usually on the sidelines of a marathon, people are applauding, there's lots of resources. When you finish, everybody claps and you get a break. This is not that. This is a very difficult, grueling uh, race that we are running right now. And each day we need to stop, be kind to ourselves and do little things for ourselves, eating well, um, drinking enough uh, fluids, exercising, and taking time for either mindfulness or relaxation or meditation. I like the point about finding meaning and purpose. Can you talk about ways to do that um, on a daily basis um, in small and large ways? Sure. So I, I think that small ways can be things like just staying in the present, noticing the new flower that's, that's grown and really just connecting with that and being very present with that. Using this as a time to connect more with our kids, connect more with our partners. I talked about some of the strain in those relationships, but the other, the other option is that we're having potentially a lot more time with them. <laughs> and so making those relationships more meaningful or reaching out to friends or coworkers or family far and wide and really not just chatting, but talking about things that matter. In addition, I firmly believe that by giving back to the community in different ways, that can give us meaning, whether that's donating money or donating goods or helping a neighbor or uh, volunteering in different ways, um, you know, starting helping out in the neighborhood, whatever things we can do to give back. I really think that that helps give meaning. Could people be experiencing mental health issues for the first time during this pandemic, for example? Someone who has never experienced any sort of anxiety now suffering with it, why could that be? There's no question that that's true. Um, we have a program in our department where we take calls from people. Uh, people can sign up for calls, healthcare workers, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And, and we, I am definitely talking to people who have never been anxious before. And I think that who are anxious now, and I think the reason for that, as I mentioned, this is a collective trauma. We've really never had anything like this in our country that has hit us and hit every single person and community and we can't get away from it and it is that that trauma the all the fear the worries about death the worries about loss of income loss of loved ones that that can make people who have no issues with anxiety very afraid and very anxious one of the most difficult aspects of this um, Patients not being with loved ones if they're critically sick. What is the emotional tell on healthcare workers? What coping strategies for healthcare workers? What about family members? So yes, I, I will say I have found this without a doubt to be one of the most painful parts of this. And I know that hospitals have been sort of struggling with exactly what their visitation policies are, whether they're going to allow any family. Some have said no family. Some initially said no family and now are trying to loosen the policies just a little to have family right at the end. I think we have um, a challenge with our values. On the one hand, physical distance is so important, we know, to, to stem the spread of this virus. And on the other hand, it is absolutely heartbreaking to see people dying by themselves it's, it's changed the role of healthcare providers because healthcare providers have become the family to the patients in those final moments or hours or, or even days. And it's been extremely painful and emotional and heart-wrenching for healthcare workers. I walked by a room and saw family members outside the room saying goodbye to a loved one. And, and I honestly started crying. I couldn't even imagine 
not being able to hold my loved one or not being able to be in the room. Nobody wants to die alone. Nobody. And nobody wants loved ones to die alone. It is awful for the patient. It is awful for the families. It is traumatic for the healthcare workers. And I think, I know that everybody's trying to find a compassionate way to make this work, whether it's to increase virtual technology, which is certainly being done more and more. Companies and organizations have been incredibly generous in donating more and more for iPads and the like to ensure better communication. Um, but it is, it is one of the worst parts of this. And I think it's something that's gonna have a lasting effect on the people who are involved and the family members who couldn't be there for their loved ones, who couldn't have the kind of funeral they would typically have based on their belief systems because of the limited number of people that are around or sort of all the rules around this. And certainly for healthcare workers, it's been very, very difficult. What are the best ways during this time to help people have lost loved ones, especially if they were not able, wait a minute, I love, okay, not able to be with them during those last moments with digital funeral streaming and not feeling like they truly had closure. How can we help these folks? Yeah, I think there's no, question. I, I was um, not able to go to my best friend's partner died and I was not able to go to that funeral and um, and it felt awful for me and it felt awful for her and we've talked a lot about it and I've talked to many people about it and I think a lot of people are talking about needing to have a celebration of life or some other kind of ritual later on when people can be together to really honor the person who died. Because I think that, that you can't resolve the grief and work through it enough when you can't do the kinds of rituals that we have in place that really make, that really make a difference for us. Um, so, so, and the other thing is people need to be able to talk about it. And the more compassion and kindness and care we can show to them, the greater off will be. Yes, there are more specific phone numbers for emotional support at Emory or Emory Resources. Um, there are a couple of websites that um, can help with that. One in em an Emory Healthcare website, one in the Department of Psychiatry, and one for the Faculty Staff Assistance Program. Also for students, there's the Counseling Center and the Psychological Clinic. With social distancing, there's a concern about social isolation, and that can lead to depression, suicide. We've seen some posts on Facebook. How effective are those? So I really think that we need to reframe social distancing to physical distancing. I think even the, the term social distancing is depressing to people. That said, even physical distancing is incredibly hard, as I mentioned earlier, and it renders people feeling, some people feeling very lonely, and that leads to depression and suicidality. And it's very concerning. I do think that the helplines and the text lines out there are helpful. They um, are getting busier and busier, but they are definitely helpful. And as I mentioned, there are more and more online mental health services that are coming available, and I encourage people to utilize those as well. All right, great. Thank you, Dr. Caswell. Um, now, um, based on the information that you provided with those that, that you mentioned, the websites and the phone numbers, we'll go ahead and include those in the email that we send out to everybody with the recording within the next 10, 15 minutes or so. Um, as a reminder, if there are any follow-up questions, um, please direct those to myself or Catherine Morrow. We will get you the answers to those. Um, we will have another briefing scheduled for Monday at uh, 9 a.m. So stay tuned for details on that. And with that, everyone have a wonderful weekend and thank you for joining us today.